Benny Applebaum, Eli Ran Kachlon, and Arpita Patra. And I think Eli Ran is going to give the talk online, correct? Yes. Can you hear me? Cool. Yes. Right. Take it away. So, okay. So hi, everyone. My name is Eli Ran. I will present a joint work with uh, Benny and Arpita about uh, verifiable relation sharing and multi-verifier zero knowledge in two rounds. And I will show that if we have an honest majority, then we have a substitute uh, for non-interactive zero knowledge and for weak assumptions. So let me start by uh, discussing multi-verifier zero knowledge. And as you know, in the standard zero, zero knowledge settings, we have one prover and one verifier, and we require the standard completeness, soundness, and zero knowledge properties. But in this work, we are interested in the case where there is one prover who wants to prove some statement in zero knowledge to many verifiers. So this can be seen as the dual to multi-prover zero knowledge. And this is in fact a common scenario in a multi-party computation where one party wants to prove some statement in a zero knowledge to the rest of the parties. So we follow the framework of a multi-party computation and we, we use ideal functionality to define a MVZK. So this is the ideal functionality of MVZK. It is a parameterized by relation R. The prover inputs a statement X and the witness W. And if the relation is satisfied, then we want all the players to, all the verifiers to know the statement X. So all the verifiers receive the statement X and they know that the statement X is true and that the prover has the corresponding witness. And of course, they have no information about this uh, witness. And uh, otherwise, if the relation is not satisfied, then the verifiers receive a special symbol that tells them that the prover tried to cheat. Okay, so this is the MVZK functionality. And uh, we want to implement it. So we assume that the players can uh, communicate over secure channels and also that they have access to a broadcast channel. And we require full security, even against an active adversary that can deviate from the protocol. And full security provides a uh, strong security guarantees, including a uh, strong completeness notion. So the, an honest prover can convince the honest verifiers that the statement is true, uh, even if uh, some of the verifiers are corrupt. We also obtain a simulation-based zero knowledge which means that the corrupt verifiers have no information about the witness. And finally, we have soundness uh, with knowledge extraction, which means that uh, a corrupt prover cannot convince the honest verifiers that uh, some false statement is true, even if some of the verifiers are corrupt. And we even have knowledge extraction, which means that uh, if the prover convinces the verifiers that the statement is true, then we can extract the witness from the joint view uh, of the honest verifiers. Uh, and in this work, we, we study uh, the round complexity of protocols that achieve those requirements. So we ask uh, how many rounds are required for MVZK, and we will be interested in a two-round protocol. So we ask, can we get a two-round MVZK protocol? And uh, it turns out that if we don't have an honest majority, then we cannot have a two-round protocol. This follows from the classic work of uh, Gondrach and Doran, and one can show that the two-round protocol exists uh, only for BPP. Okay, I, now I do want to mention that if we have a common random string, then there exists a one-step protocol for all of NP. This is non-interactive zero knowledge, and you can achieve it either from a public key assumptions or in the random working model. Okay, but like I said, this is not a two-run protocol, and we cannot get a two-run protocol without honest majority. However, if we do have honest majority, then we can get a two-run protocol. Uh, so just like before, we cannot get a one-round protocol. One-round protocol exists only for BPP, but we can get a two-round protocol for of NP. And uh, this protocol is implicit in the work of uh, Groten Ostrovsky, and it requires public key encryption and uh, non-interactive zero knowledge. And this protocol actually has this nice feature that the first round is independent of the inputs. And this means that the players can execute the first round even before the prover knows the statement and the witness, which are only required for the second round. Um, but as you can see, the assumptions required for this protocol are essentially the same assumptions required for a non-interactive zero knowledge, uh, or maybe even stronger assumptions like public encryption. Uh, and therefore we ask, can we use the fact that we have an honest majority in order to get rid of the NISC assumption? And who knows, maybe we can even use mini-crypt type assumptions. So in this work, we show that it is possible. So we assume the existence of non-interactive commitments and we show that there exists a two round MVZK protocol, again, with this nice feature of offline online round, so that if the number of parties is constant, we obtain optimal uh, resiliency for honest majority. This means that the number of corrupt parties T should be at mo uh, less than one half of the number of parties N. And uh, otherwise, if the number of parties is larger, if it is polynomial, then we obtain almost optimal resiliency, which means that the number of corrupt parties T should be at most, let's say, uh, 0.499, the number of parties N. This constant can be any constant arbitrarily close to one half. 
So those are the results regarding game VZK. And I want to highlight the case of uh, one prover and two verifiers. So this means that by adding just a single verifier to the standard zero knowledge settings, you can get a two round uh, protocol which that provides full security and for mini crypt type assumptions. Okay, now let me say a few words about the uh, non-interactive commitments. So there are two kinds of non-interactive commitments. The first one is the computationally hiding non-interactive non commitments. And uh, if we use this kind of commitments, then we also need uh, some kind of security against selective opening attacks. But uh, those uh, commitments can be constructed for many crypt type assumptions. For example, they can be constructed from injective one-way functions uh, with sub-exponential hardness, uh, or even from standard one-way functions with sub-exponential hardness together with a common random string or under some de-randomization assumptions. Okay, so again, if we use those commitments that uh, can be obtained for many crypt type assumptions, uh, then we obtain the results for, uh, that I've just described in the previous slide. Uh, the second kind of commitments are statistically hiding. And uh, if we use this kind of commitments, then we obtain a protocol that provides a stronger notion of security, which is called the everlasting security. So this means that the protocol is secure against an adversary which is bounded during the execution, but can be unbounded after the execution of the protocol. Okay, so everlasting security uh, can be seen as a, as a security notion in between computational security and the uh, information theoretic security. And the uh, statistically hiding non interactive commitments can be based on collision resistant hash functions. So again, we get the mini crypt type assumption. There is a small technicality regarding how we select the hash function. So one option is to use a common random string that just samples a random hash function from the family. We can also have an additional offline round in which the, in which the players uh, sample this hash function. And finally, if the adversary is uniform, then the hash function can be fixed and we don't need uh, the solutions. Okay, so again, the main point, if you use uh, statistically hiding non-interactive commitments, we obtain everlasting security. Now let me mention a, an application of MVZK. So MVZK captures an important aspect of uh, non-interactive uh, zero knowledge, which is the minimum uh, round complexity. Okay, which means that if we have an honest majority, MVZK can be seen as a substitute for non-interactive zero knowledge, where the CRS is replaced with a single offline round, and then the proof requires only one round. And in addition, we also provide UC security, which means that you can use our MVZK protocol in your protocols instead of NISC. And uh, finally, the main point, of course, is that we get all of this from a mini crypt type assumptions. Okay, so this was MVZK. But in the paper, we study a more general problem called the verifiable relation sharing. And uh, so, so far we assume that uh, everyone knows the same statement. But uh, what happens if the statement is distributed among the verifiers? Okay, so in this scenario, the prover knows all the information, he knows the statement, the witness, and all the shares, and every verifier knows exactly one share of the statement, and the prover wants to prove that the shared statement is true in zero knowledge. So this is the scenario that occurs in a multi-party computation, but also in a practice in cases like, like a private data aggregation and the anonymous communication. And I do want to mention the work of uh, Bonnet, Bo and Corrigan Gibbs, Gimbo and Ishai, uh, that initiated a formal study of uh, zero knowledge proofs over shared data. Okay, so uh, this is a zero knowledge proofs over shared data and verifiable relation sharing can be seen as a generalization of the scenario where we consider both the sharing of the statement X and also the proving that the statement X is true at the same time. Okay, so again, we formalize it by using an ideal functionality. Uh, and like I said, the prover wants to share the statement X. So those are the shares of the statement X. They have one share for each verifier. And he also wants to prove that the shared statement is true. So he inputs a, a secret witness. And again, if the relation is satisfied, then every verifier receives exactly one share. So every verifier knows one share but he has no information about uh, the other shares or about the secret witness. And on the other hand, if the relation is not satisfied, then the verifiers receive a special symbol that tells them that the prover tried to cheat. So this is the VRS functionality. And let me mention that the VRS captures and generalizes several cryptographic primitives like a verifiable and secret sharing. So here, for example, we want to share a value and also prove that the shares correspond to a low degree polynomial. It also captures secure multicast and like I said, multi-verifier zero knowledge. And it can be seen as a generalization of a zero knowledge proofs over shared data. Good. And just like before, we are interested in the case of honest majority and we require full security against an active adversary. And again, this implies a strong completeness notion, a simulation based security and the soundness of knowledge extraction. 
and we studied the round complexity of protocols that, of protocols that achieve those guarantees. So let me tell you what is known about the round complexity of uh, VRS. So this is a work in progress again with Benny and Arpita in which we show that uh, a two round uh, VRS with information theoretic security is impossible. Okay, so if we want the two round protocol, we cannot get it uh, with information theoretic security. And therefore we again consider a uh, computational security. But even with computational security, the best upper bound that we have is the three round protocol of ACGJ. Uh, so this is in fact a protocol for general MPC and it requires a public key encryption and uh, non-interactive zero knowledge. So this is the best upper bound that we have. And uh, of course there is an lower bound of one round. So one, one round VRS is impossible. Okay, but as you can see, the question of a uh, two round uh, VRS is open. And uh, we show that we can get a two round VRS and even from a mini crypt type assumption. So those are essentially the same results uh, as for MVZK. So we assume non-interactive commitments just like before and we obtain a two round VRS protocol. So that if the number of parties is constant, we obtain an optimal resiliency and otherwise we obtain a almost optimal resiliency. Okay, so those are the results regarding uh, VRS. And let me mention some applications. So in a follow-up work again with Benny and Arpita, <coughs> we show that we can use the VRS protocol in order to obtain a round optimal uh, multi-party computation for mini crypt type assumptions. So we show, we construct a three round honest majority protocol that provides full security, and we use the same assumptions that we use for the VRS. Okay, and the previous works required public key encryption and the non-interactive zero knowledge. Now there are more applications. I do want to mention that the VRS uh, turns out to be equivalent to single input functionalities. So those are functionalities that receive the input from a single party and then give output to all the parties. And uh, one can show that these two are equivalent. And so another way to think of our results is that uh, every single input functionality can be implemented in two rounds with full security and uh, for many crypt type assumptions. Okay, so those are the, applica the applications of MBZK. And now I will, present part, I will present part of the proof idea in a simplified way. So I'm making it a strong simplifying assumption and I assume that I have nice verifiable secret sharing. So what does it mean? I assume that I have this magic box for verifiable secret sharing that receives the a secret S from the prover. It then generates Shamir shares of the shares that are publicly committed. Okay, so the functionality samples a random degree T polynomial, its free coefficient is the secret, just like in a Shamir secret sharing, and commits to, to the Shamir shares. And then it gives every verifier an opening to exactly one commitment. Okay, so now every verifier knows exactly one share of the secret S. And uh, just like in Shamir secret sharing, you can show the tip players have no information about the secret, but tip plus one can recover the secret. And I am using the homomorphic commitments, which means that this uh, uh, secret sharing scheme is linear. And uh, I also want you to notice that uh, the verifiers, because I'm using commitments, then the verifiers can either open the correct share or open an erasure because the commitments are binding. So this will be important later. And finally, the main point is, of course, that uh, the output is one formed even for a corrupt prover. Okay, so this is my uh, simplifying assumption. I assume that I have this magic box and I assume that I have homomorphic commitments. But of course in the paper, uh, we cannot implement this magic box in one round. And of course the non-interactive commitments do not, are usually not uh, homomorphic. So we cannot assume that. And uh, much of the technical details uh, in our paper actually devoted in order to get rid of these two assumptions. Okay, so I'm making this uh, simplifying assumption just for this talk. Okay, now I will show you the heart of the construction, which is a protocol for a triple secret sharing. So this is just a special case of verifiable secret sharing, where the prover wants to share a triple A, B, and C, and also to prove that C is equal to A, B. So formally the prover inputs a triple, and if C is equal to A, B, then this, uh, the functionality should generate shares of A, of B, and of C by using the same uh, secret sharing scheme that I've just described. And otherwise, if C is not equal to A, B, then the verifier should know that the prover tried to cheat. Okay, so this is the functionality that I want to implement and I want to a protocol that uh, implements this uh, functionality in two rounds. Okay, so I will start by describing a three round protocol and then I will explain how to reduce one round. So in the first round, the prover picks random polynomials A of X and B of X, uh, and he also computes C of X, which is A of X and B of X, times B of X, so that the free coefficient of, e of A of X is the is the value A, the free coefficient of B of X is B, and therefore the free coefficient of C of X is C. 
and uh, the prover shares the coefficients of those polynomials by using the magic box. Okay, so at the end of the round, on the, the verifiers have shared for every coefficient of these polynomials. Okay, so this is the first round. So I wanted to notice that because A, B, and C are just the free coefficients of, the, of these polynomials, then they're already shared, and therefore it only remains to prove that C is equal to A, B. So in the second round, I let the verifiers uh, broadcast random challenges. Those are just random field elements which are not zero. So this is the second round of the protocol. And in the third round of the protocol, I let the verifiers compute the values of F and phi, B of and phi, and C of and phi for every challenge. Okay, and uh, we can do it because uh, A of and phi, for example, is just a linear function of the coefficient of the polynomial A of X. Okay, because we have a linear secret challenge scheme, the verifiers can compute those commitments to the shares of A of and phi, and now every honest verifier will open the correct value, while the corrupt, corrupt verifier can either open the correct value or an erasure. Okay, so because I have an honest majority, this guarantees that I have at least T plus one correct shares. And like I said, the corrupt parties can either reveal the correct share or an erasure. Okay, so I have enough shares to recover A of, A of alpha. Okay, so in this way, we recover those values, and then we verify that C of alpha is equal to F alpha times B of alpha. Okay, so this is the three on protocol. You can see that it has this uh, classic uh, structure of uh, zero knowledge, where we first uh, commit to some values, then we challenge, and then there is a response. And uh, I want you to notice that we have a soundness because if C of X is not equal to FX times B of X, then with high probability C of M phi will not be equal to F and phi times B of M phi. And uh, the reason that we have a uh, privacy here is that the only thing that the adversary sees is the, are those points. And those points reveal no information about the free coefficients if the degree of the polynomials is large enough, just like in Shamir signature. Okay, so this is our three on protocol. But like I said, we wanted a two on protocol. So some of you might ask, why not use the Fiat Shamir heuristic? And the reason is that I want uh, to obtain a protocol for many crypt type assumptions. So we don't want to use the Fiat Shamir heuristic, uh, but I will show that if we have an honest majority, then we actually have a substitute uh, for the Fiat Shamir heuristic. Okay, so, you know, here is a naive approach. Let, let's try to generate the challenges at the same time that the prover picks the polynomial C of X, B of X, and C of X. So let's try this protocol, but it turns out that this protocol is not secure and the problem is with the rushing adversary. So a rushing adversary is an adversary that can first uh, see the messages from the honest parties and only then send the messages of the corrupt parties. So if the prover is corrupt and rushing, then he can first see the challenges of the, of the honest parties and only then pick those polynomials. And this means that he can cheat, okay? We will have problem with, uh, with the soundness. So this protocol is not secure, but what we will do is actually to generate the challenges already in the first round, but in a secret way, so that the prover will not know at least the one challenge. And then we will use the fact that we have an honest majority and that the verifiers can answer the challenges by themselves. Okay, so let's start with a toy version in which the identity of the corrupt parties is known. Okay, so those are the, verifi the honest verifiers and they know that these two are corrupt. So just like before, in the first round, the prover generates A of X, B of X, and C of X, and now we also let the honest verifiers to generate a secret challenge. So some of one of the verifiers picks a random field element and uh, sends it to the honest verifiers by using the secure channels. So the adversary has no information about this challenge alpha, and therefore it is independent of the polynomials. And in the second round, I just let every honest verifier to reveal its shares of A of alpha, B of alpha, and C of alpha. And because I have an honest majority, I'm guaranteed to have at least T plus one shares. And therefore we can recover the values of A of alpha, B of alpha, and C of alpha and verify that C of alpha is equal to A of alpha times B of alpha. Okay, so this uh, toy version is secure, but of course we don't know the identity of the corrupt parties. So what we do is to consider every set S of T plus one uh, parties. Okay, so we consider every such set and for every such set, in the first round, we generate a secret challenge alpha S. And in the second round, we require from the parties to open the shares of A of alpha S, B of alpha S, and C of alpha S, just like we did in the toy version. Now, of course, most of the sets contain uh, corrupt parties so they can sabotage uh, each of these rounds, but we are guaranteed that at least one set contains only honest parties from which uh, two, these two rounds will be executed just like in the two version, and therefore we have soundness. Okay, so this is the main idea behind the, two on the triple secret sharing. Now, I do want you to notice that the number of uh, sets is exponential in the number of parties, and therefore this protocol is only secure for a small number of parties. I will not be able to talk about uh, VRS for many parties, 
But I do want to mention that we combine two known techniques from the literature of uh, MPC and uh, zero knowledge. So we combine MPC in the head with virtualization and we show a new distributed version of MPC in the head. And we also use virtualization in a round preserving way, which means that we take the VRS for a small number of parties and we transform it into a VRS for many parties with the same round complexity as the original protocol. And this is not uh, trivial because usually virtualization incurs a large overhead in the round complexity. So let me summarize, uh, we've seen verifiable relation sharing in the uh, multi verifier zero knowledge. We said that if we have an honest majority, then there exists a uh, two-round protocol for meaningful type assumptions. And even with this nice feature of offline online round, we've discussed everlasting security that we can get from uh, statistically hiding commitments. What I didn't talk about is how to get rid of the simplifying assumptions that I've made. So in the paper, we show protocols that uh, provide round efficient linear operations over non-homomorphic commitments, and they didn't talk about VRS for many parties. And there are several uh, open questions. Uh, can we get optimal resiliency for many parties? Uh, and can we relax the requirements? Can we get rid of the sub-exponential harness? And can we get everlasting security without the CRS and maybe even for one functions? Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the talk, Eliran. Uh, are there questions from the audience? Um, I have one, um, maybe while the next speaker is setting up. Um, so, so if you, since you're using broadcast and there's communication also from the verifiers to the prover for the MVZK, um, can you actually distinguish between um, the prover um, doing something wrong or some of the verifiers interfering with the proof? So some kind of identifiability. Um, so no, we, we have a guaranteed output delivery. So if the prover is honest, we are guaranteed that all the honest verifiers will receive the correct chair. So we know that the statement is true. But uh, I mean, the prover can do some wrong things in the protocol, but uh, we are guaranteed that the output will be well formed. Okay? Either the statement is true or it will be rejected. Okay. Um, are there more questions? Otherwise, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks. And the last talk of the session will be about authenticated garbling from simple correlations by uh, Samuel Dittmer, Yuval Ishai, Steve Liu, and Rafael Ostrovsky. And Sam will give the talk. Uh, this is joint work with Yuval Shai. Uh, Steve Liu. Uh, joint work, Yuval Shai, Steve Liu, and Rafi Ostrovsky. My mic is working. And this is in garbling from simple correlations. Uh, our goal in this work is concretely efficient, confident round malicious two party computation uh, built off of garbled circuits. And we make significant improvements over the state of the art work based on authenticated garbling using uh, what we call simple kinds of correlated randomness. This means stuff that can be uh, silently generated with sublinear communication and concrete efficiency. And my goals for this talk is to explain something about why you should care about this and then something about the fun nitty gritty, nitty -gritty details about how it actually works uh, in that order. But we're going to begin with just 
plain old garbled circuits. So in a garbled circuit, the uh, plain text wires WA, WB, and that and together to form WC are garbled so that there are wire labels LA0, LA1 for each wire, and then a mask bit lambda unknown to the evaluator. So the evaluator is going to learn this XOR of the true wire value with lambda for every wire and the corresponding wire label. So you get the first wire label from an oblivious transfer. And then from there on out, you have this garbled table, which is uh, too small to include on this slide to get to the next wire, wire value. There has been a lot of progress over the years on making garbled tables more efficient. Uh, so is initially four ciphertexts per gate, one per row of the truth table. So they got down to three by making the first row free. Uh, then you got rid of the XOR gates, made those free. And then the work, the half gates of Zahura at all gives you two ciphertexts per gate. And then I will mention this most recent work by Ross Luke and Roy from last year that gets you down to 1.5 ciphertext. So they are still making progress in this area. But our work is sort of orthogonal to this because instead of dealing with improving the semi-honest garbling, we're interested in making efficient malicious garbling off of semi-honest garbling. So the reason why malicious garbling is hard is because in the semi-honest version, one party does almost all of the work. They build the garbled circuit from scratch. And so there's a lot of room to cheat. Uh, you can sort of encode any logic you want into the garbled table. You can mess it up in all sorts of ways. So the initial work to make this secure was to uh, do a cut and choose kind of technique. So the garbler generates a whole bunch of copies of the circuit and the evaluator gets to open certain ones and check that they're actually done correctly and then use the remainder to actually evaluate the circuit. Uh, so this was gone down to an efficiency of you know row times the number of garbled circuits or row, row copies of the garbled circuit. So with row equals 40, that's 40 times something honest version. And I will want to also mention that uh, later works were also able to make this protocol non-interactive. So there was a substantial improvement over those prior works from Wang et al. and later extended by Katz et al. in something called authenticated garbling. And so the way to think about this is you start with a garbled circuit and you have some sort of OT-based tool for wire authentication, which gives you constant round malicious secure two-party computation. And to give some concrete numbers, the Katz, or the Wang et al. protocol which is built off of free XOR, requires only 11 times the cost of semi honest. And CATS et al. requires uh, about eight times the cost of semi honest using the half gates. And what we do, again, at a very high level, is we take that OT based machinery for wire authentication and we swap it out with what we call simple correlations. Uh, and I am going to break one of the fundamental rules of giving a talk and introduce a whole bunch of notation here that I'm not going to explain because I will explain it later, but I want to, to sort of give some numbers about what's going on. So uh, we have our construction, which also works with uh, the free XOR construction and the half gate construction, although it does not work with the new slice and dice techniques. So that's sort of a, an interesting question we haven't looked into much yet, uh, but using those boxes indicate different flavors of correlated randomness, which we'll describe more, but we get down to in the neighborhood of uh, 1.3 or 2.3 times the cost of a semi honest circuit. And also using OLE randomness, we can get down to eight times the cost of semi honest for non interactive communication. So uh, this completes the very short version of the talk. So I will proceed with another copy of the talk that is longer. And uh, we're going to start with talking about what authenticated garbling is in some detail and then give you sort of a blueprint for how all of these constructions work. Then uh, talk about where the simple correlations actually fit into everything. So that's sort of coming down the road. And then finally, we get our hands dirty with just some of the nitty gritty stuff, which is hopefully fun. So back to a semi-honest garbled circuit. This is a way to write the garbled table. So on the right, uh, the thing to notice there is that if you have exactly one of the LA values and one of the LB values, then by X XORing out that hash function, you can open one row. And then recall that uh, the lambda values are the, uh, the masks of the wire, and the Z values are the 
masked values, so what the evaluator sees. And so you can just sort of check that what the what the true value should be the masked value XOR with the mask. And that so Z00, for example, XOR with lambda C should be the true value. And then uh, lambda A and lambda B should be the true value if both of your mask, uh, both of your masked bits are zero. So that's what it looks like in semi-honest land. Uh, also, the horizontal lines are knots, which have moved around on the page. So that's unfortunate, but adds to the fun. Um, oh, this has also moved around. So uh, not to scale on the graph. Uh, that, that's right. That's right. Garbled slides. So it's, it's a talk mixed with the stand-up routine, guys. Um, so, as we've said before, the reason malicious garbling is tricky is because the garbler can cheat and just encode whatever logic they want. They can replace all of these ZIJs with just Z00 across the board. And then they can like, you know, mess with the output in all sorts of annoying ways. So one way to fix this, which is what authenticated garbling does, is you add some sort of uh, message authentication code. You add like a Mac on top of this. Uh, so that when you open your particular row, you get proof that that row was garbled correctly. But this introduces a new problem because now you allow selective failure attacks. What this means is that if A just, just uh, misgarbles one of the rows, then A is going to learn if you went to that row because you're gonna abort when you hit that misgarbled value. And so uh, A is gonna learn at least one bit of your input. So the trick to, to blocking this attack is that these Lambda values are now secret shared among uh, both parties so that both parties have no idea which row the table corresponds to which entry. And so that way, uh, A learns nothing even if you do abort because from A's perspective, it, all rows are identical. And so if, if they burn a row, they're just making the table worse, but not in a way that's going to indicate anything about B's input. And then the authentication, you have these, you know, the Lambda A, Lambda B, Lambda C values. And if you have additionally uh, Lambda A and Lambda B, and authenticated shares of all of these things, then together with those values, you can uh, you know, generate max for all the rows. So that was an overview of sort of how the construction works as understanding going from garbling into authenticated garbling. We're now gonna describe the construction going uh, sort of from low level details up to garbling. Uh, the following is a terrible joke. I like this the clip art, but uh, it, it's not a work in progress. It is construction to follow. So it's not under construction, it's under construction. Uh, this, this bad joke inspired by a Jeffrey Tambor movie. Um, so the overall blueprint going from low level to high level, we're gonna start with authenticating bits and then we're gonna authenticate a very simple kind of circuit, a bunch of parallel AND gates. And then we're gonna authenticate general circuits and then go back to authenticated garbage. So when you authenticate bits, back to our pretty picture of an AND gate, uh, which, and luckily the, the values are close to where they're, they're supposed to be now. So we're happy. Um, you want to authenticate each mask, uh, lambda, and I've been throwing around the word authenticated shares. And what we mean specifically is you want shares of the, of the mask lambda and the shares of alpha lambda and beta lambda, where alpha is known to A and beta is known to B. This means basically you convince can convince both A and B of whatever you want to about what you're doing with the masks. Now for authenticated parallel AND, you have this very specialized circuit, which is just a bunch of AND gates in a row. And so you want these authenticated shares of the Lambda A and Lambda B terms, but you restrict to this case where uh, you know exactly which A, I, B, I, you know, A1, B1, A2, B2, and so on and there's no interaction between any of the wires. Still, uh, this is the most expensive part of the construction. And I mentioned earlier that there are three constructions. We're not going to describe them all in great detail, but I will say that the way you do authenticated parallel and at each of the constructions is different and uses different randomness. But once you have the authenticated parallel and, then you wanna compile that to authenticated wires and authenticated you know, and values for every, for every gate in your real circuit. So, you know, now, for example, WG is the end of WC and WF, which is previously XORed of other values. So there's, so you have to make this sort of circuit dependent 
So you're going to require more communication. But this is actually relatively cheap compared to the previous slide once you have the parallel and in place. Um, and once you have all of that, you now have the authentication of your Lambda values, and we now have a new, a new garbled slide. Uh, so neither you nor I can read what this says, but uh, all we've changed from the previous authenticated, the previous semi-honest garbling is that in the second, in the garbled table column, we've changed the ZIJ into SIJ, which is a concatenation of A's share of ZIJ with A's share of beta times ZIJ. So when uh, B opens up the row, they're going to see the value Z, their share of the value ZIJ, so they can reconstruct ZIJ. They can also reconstruct beta times ZIJ. A doesn't have beta, so there's no way that A can uh, so there's no way that A can cheat on this authentication without knowing beta. Or second bullet point says there are other ways of doing this. You can also just open the value ZIJ and not authenticate till the very end, uh, because once the circuit is done evaluating, it can't abort anymore, so it, there can't be any more selective failure attacks. So at that point, there's no harm in B telling A what path they went through, and then A authenticating. Now, the talk is titled Authenticated Garbly from Simple Correlations. So I want to explain what you can get away with if you just sort of allow any correlation you want. So first of all, we started with authenticated bits and then went to authenticated parallel AND gates. And as I said, that step was hard. So you can just skip to that step and just generate authenticated parallel AND gates from scratch. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, while we're dreaming, uh, garbled circuits are a kind of randomness. So you could have a pseudo randomness correlation generator that just generates garbled circuit and also generates you know, the initial input wires with an authentication point of that. And then you have great communication, but none of this exists or we don't know how to do it efficiently. And so kind of this is where the work lies is this is what would be perfect, but how do we get from what we actually have to something like this? So we have simple correlations instead. And let me sort of spell out what we do have. We have basically two kinds of randomness. We have vector oblivious linear evaluation or VOL, which has been studied a great deal in the last five years, where you take a scalar times a vector and you share it. And then you also have multiplication triple type randomness. Multiplication triple type randomness is of course not new. It goes back to like GMW kinds of constructions and beaver, beaver triples, but only recently have we been able to generate it concretely efficiently. Uh, using this ring LPN work. And I'm just going to mention briefly that all of these simple correlations can sort of be made modular. You can think of them as using sort of correlation calculus, which allows you to generate a bunch of variants of vol type and MT type for the constructions that we're going to need. So having now given the brief overview of what we're doing, I'm going to try to get into the fun details. Uh, there is luckily no joke associated with this slide, but uh, I'm going to talk about the second construction, which is a construction that uses uh, vector OLE only to build uh, authentication, authenticated garbling. So recall, step one is we need authenticated share bits. And the happy news is we get this for free, basically. So we need the wire masks lambda. And we need that the wire mass to be shared. So we're gonna have a vector A held by A and a vector B held by B. So using vector OLE, you can just share alpha times B and beta times A. And now you want shares of alpha times lambda. So if you take A's share of alpha times B, which they know, and then alpha times A, which they know because they know A and they know alpha, and then B's share of alpha times B and add it together, you get alpha times lambda. And similarly, you now have shares of beta times lambda. And I'll point out here that you want A and B to be randomly generated from F2, but you want the sharing to be over F2 uh, to the row or F2 to the kappa, so either the statistical or computational security parameter. So here, we're not technically using the vol, we're using subfield vol, where the vector comes from a subfield of where the shares are located at. And I'll also point out that this is sort of what you do for every construction is some kind of vol magic to sort of get your authenticated bits for free. Now, authenticated parallel and, as I said earlier, is where it gets tricky. Uh, so the top is some good old classic uh, distributive property. 
if you expand out what lambda i and lambda j is, which we need to authenticate and share. And we have basically three kinds of terms, ai and aj, bi and bj, ai and bj. So ai and aj and bi and bj are basically the same. And these are both doable with one new kind of machinery that I'm going to throw out in the last second. So line point zero knowledge, uh, LPZK, is one of a family of vol-based zero knowledge proofs. And one of the things that makes these things nice is that since they're already based on vol, they give a very natural way to prove things about vol. So you can prove any relation you want on the entries of vol. And if that relation is uh, low, low depth, for example, a bunch of quadratics, you can do it basically for free. So uh, in addition to the vector beta times a you have, you also include all the values a, i, and a, j. And you can sort of authenticate that those satisfy the product relations you want for free. However, you still have the a, i, and b, j terms, and those you do not get for free. So those are going to re require more work. So we have an idea with a question mark, which is a spoiler for how well this idea is going to work. So uh, you want AI and BJ times beta. So you can write it in that form. And then look, if uh, so if you take beta BJ as your scalar in your vol, then beta BJ is your scalar, A is a vector, and voila, you have shares of AI times beta BJ, and you can read off all the terms you want for all your different AND gates. So, the nice, so I mentioned the little correlation calculus that allows you to generate a whole bunch of flavors of vol. This is a flavor called block vol. And what's nice is we can reuse the vector A for free. So we don't have to send A for all these different instances of the vol. So that's great. But uh, you may notice that we're doing this for every single AND gate. So we need an instance of vol for every single AND gate. So it kind of kills the point of having sublinear communication per vol when you have a linear numbers of vol. So this is no good. So, okay, this slide is mostly readable. It's great. Uh, so here is the exciting trick we do. So we want a vector B of wire labels, and we're instead going to generate a short vector of that beta star, beta star one up to beta star L, and expand it with a random matrix into a longer vector B star. Uh, so we just take some random linear transformation and apply it to the short vector. Why do we do this? Well, uh, every AI and BJ star term, so the BJ is some matrix times beta, so it's just a linear combination of terms, beta star. So we have a linear of AI beta star terms to get you each you know, cross term we need. And since we only have L of them, which is a, sm a relatively small number, we only need a handful of instances of vol now instead of you know, N instances of vol. However, we just sort of, you know, cheated really badly because we used to have n separate bits of randomness guarding b's input, and now we just have log n. So, uh, how do we get away with that? We have a whole bunch of relations now on the wire labels, and um, if we want to be precise and linear algebra about it, uh, for every vector in the co-kernel of R, which is large because it's an n by log n matrix. There's some linear combination of wire masks where you have, you know, VT, yeah, you can check this linear algebra, VT lambda equals VT A plus VT R beta star, and VT is in the co-kernel of R, so uh, A knows VT lambda. So A knows a ton of information about what's going on in the garbled table. But remember, the reason we cared about A uh, knowing stuff was because of selective failure attacks. So it is a sort of combinatorial fact you can prove with some fancy machinery like Thurling's formula, and I think there's a Markov bound in there or something, that uh, when you have uh, what row log n independent columns, then you're going to have anything in the co-kernel has at least uh, row non-zero entries. So this means you need at least row, row labels before you get a linear relationship. So if you want to use a selective failure attack, on something where A actually knows the masks, then A has to corrupt at least row table entries in order to get any information. But if A corrupts row table entries, then there is a uh, one minus two to the negative row probability that you abort 
So B is it's going to always abort, so you still don't get any information. And so uh, either A corrupts a few table entries and it, and it still looks independent, or A corrupts a lot of table entries, and you just always abort, and so you still get no information. Um, I want to uh, semi-close with this lovely quote by Mr. Fermat and throw a whole bunch of other things that we did not have time to get to in this talk. Uh, so the first construction that actually gets our fastest number uses MT type randomness uh, to build the parallel AND gates. Uh, when we do NISC, we can't have any back and forth. So we do this, we can't have a vol in both directions. So we have to use uh, OLE. We have a bunch of different flavors of randomness. When you use like an alpha in one randomness and another randomness, you have to check that it's the same alpha. This requires some algebraic checking. Uh, when you do NISC, you need conditional disclosure of secrets. Uh, I didn't know what this was before I wrote this paper, so I thought it was a fun exercise to figure out how this works. If that sounds fun, maybe it'll be a fun exercise to read. Uh, and then there's this trick we do at some point where we build the parallel AND gates with statistical security instead of computational security, which costs you know a multiple of rho instead of kappa, so save the factor of three somewhere. And then you can cheaply go from statistical to computational security. And additionally, uh, in the authentication step, we sort of have to mix and match some of the tools from Wang et al. and Katz et al. because some of the tools from Katz et al. involve communication and other things. So for, for various reasons in both the vol only construction and the NIST construction, you can't uh, have this back and forth. So you have to have a mix of the half gates for part of it and the free XOR gates for. So basically, it's the half gates for the wire label and the free XOR for the authentication. And to really close, I just want to again put our numbers up here. And now that I've told you about all of this bowl and speeds and stuff, I can give the sort of apples to oranges and the apples to apples comparison. So at the top are Wang et al. and Katz et al.'s uh, work built off of OT machinery. And you can take vol based randomness or speed style tricks in, I guess, kind of a natural way without a lot of thought and apply it to their work. And you do get improvements, but uh, and you get, you know, you can get down to as good as 2.5 times the cost of something honest. But uh, using our more careful constructions, you, get, you can get down to uh, 1.3 times something honest. And in the non-interactive setting, uh, we improve on the prior work by a factor of five. Thank you for your attention. Um, thanks for the talk, Sam. Are there questions? Um, maybe I'll torture you with one before the coffee break. Um, it looks nice in terms of reducing the communication for everything, but these vol based techniques are then a bit more computationally heavy than what was there before. So do you have any ideas of how expensive this will be in comparison to use something that has more communication overhead? Yeah. So uh, there's an estimate in the paper basically built on, uh, you know, what is the published state of the art for how fast vol should be and how fast M multiplication triple generation should be. And we say that if you just sort of like add up the seconds to generate the amount of vol or MT you need, that our first and third construction, so the MT construction and the NIST construction should be compatible with state of the art around a million gates. And the vol only construction should be, should be competitive around 10 million gates. So. Um, mm, okay, that's a gate number. So what about, what about like at some point uh, the, Right. If if your if your bandwidth is uh, big enough, then I guess the old constructions might be faster. Or um, is this only dependent on the number of gates? Uh, no, that's fair. Yeah. So you are dealing with this is optimizing communication complexity. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So if you have you know a totally local local network, uh, then you might not care as much about this. But so the other advantage here is that it's constant round, which again is an advantage in wide area network more than local mm -hmm. network. Okay, I guess implementation coming soon in the next paper. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Then uh, something to look forward to. Let's thanks uh, Sam and all the speakers of the first session. And it's coffee time. Mm -hmm.